The Rocky Mountains cover over 1 million kilometers square, contain over 2,200 species of butterflies and 270 species of birds. There's also mountain goats, grizzly bears, eagles, and this little guy. Howdy Naturinos, I'm Gordy, and today on Frick I Love Nature, we're going to strap on our hiking boots and blast straight into the Rocky Mountains. Today we're going to learn how some species live at different elevations amongst the Rockies. Mountains consist of three ecological zones based off of elevation, the montane, subalpine, and the alpine. The montane is the lowest elevation of the mountain. This is where most species hang out because it's got lots of water, food, and protection from predators. Who lives in the montane? Elk, cougars, lynx, wabbits, trees, and the most terrific of them all, the American red squirrel. With their floofy tails, tiny noses, and adorable squirrel chatter, red squirrels may seem like a harmless cutie pie. But guess what? They kill squirrel babies. When a he squirrel sees that a she squirrel has had babies with a dude other than himself, he sometimes gets so jealous that he kills those babies in the hopes that the she squirrel might want to have babies with him this time. Other species commit infanticide too, like grizzly bears, monkeys, and all these other ones. Not all species in the montane are baby killers though. Some are made out of hats. The beaver is a keystone species. Without a keystone species, the ecosystem it's in would be completely different or may not even exist at all. The dams the engineer create bodies of water which dozens of species depend on. The largest beaver dam ever discovered is estimated to have begun construction in the 70s. It can be seen from space and is over 850 meters long. That's over two and a half times longer than the Hoover Dam. Not only are they incredible engineers, they got cool butts. Their butts contain a gland that releases a yellow oil that helps mark their territory called castorium. Even though it comes out of a butt, castorium has the homey delicious smell of vanilla. And for the longest time was used as a natural vanilla flavoring for treats. These butt glands also secrete a waterproofing oil that they comb through their fur. It's like being able to pull a raincoat out of your butthole. Ascending up the mountain at alarming rates, and we've reached our second destination, the subalpine. The subalpine is the middle part of the mountain and encompasses everything from the base of the montane up to the tree line, which is the point where the trees stop growing. Lots of cool stuff lives in the subalpine dense pine forests, wildcats, grizzly bears, and mountain goats. To learn more about these beauties, I met up with Julien, a French Canadian mountain goat researcher. What about a mountain goat makes it so agile and like able to climb cliffs? Well, there's a lot of adaptation of, throughout the body and the, just the shape of the body and the, the way that the ooze are made and the different placement of the muscle and all that can help them to move around the cliff. There's like two nails on each hoof and both nails can move independently so they can put different amount of power in each one and also like most of the unglets that we call like all the animals that walk on their nails like anything like horses cows anything like that underneath it's kankai so only the outside of the nail actually touches the ground and they, that's where the traction is but with the goats it's like the opposite and this part is kind of soft and grippy, like uh, climbing shoes, like rock climbing shoes. And so when they walk on a rock, it actually imprints in the ooze and then it added traction and they can have traction across the whole hoof instead of just the outside like other unglets. So like a, a goat could like stand like on a really small, thin, like one inch ledge almost. Pretty much, yeah. The one thing about mountain goats is one of the most aggressive mammals we know, uh, like the rate of aggressive interaction among individuals is one of the highest ever recorded. They can kick with the front paw amongst them and that they, they even like the males do that and they actually kick themselves in the balls. After learning I shouldn't be friends with mountain goats, I decide to check out the kind of vegetation that lives on the edges of the subalpine. Way up high here on the mountaintop where trees don't grow, 
Some trees still grow. The spruce and fir trees that live in the harshest areas of the subalpine take on a quality called crummy hole, which means they are curled, short, and stubby. The parts of the crummer that grow the shortest and stubbiest are also the healthiest. When you see a crumb puppy with only branches growing on one side, this is called a flag tree. The bare side of the crumble bumble is the part that gets whipped with wind, rain, and snow, so nothing grows there. By only growing branches on one side, the crummled tree can survive in harsh conditions. Some of the trees are so hardy they can survive on the toughest conditions on the mountain, the alpine. The super duper low temperatures, strong as heck winds, and not much water. The alpine is where only the hardiest of species can survive. Lichen is the toughest inhabitant of the alpine. It can survive being completely dried out, it gets battered by intense alpine UV radiation, and it literally feeds off rocks. It's so tough, lichen was once sent to space for 14 and a half days, and when it came back, there was no evidence of cell damage. Not only that, but lichen were some of the first plants to colonize the Earth 750 million years ago. The enzymes they create broke down the ancient rocks and over time made the soil good enough for large plants to live in. Without lichen, we might not have Froot Loops or Pikas. We're here up in the Alpine to talk about Pikas. So, why would a Pikachu want to live up here in the Alpine? Gord, I've never seen a up here, but we certainly have pikas that live in the alpine. If it's so difficult to live here, why would pikas choose to live up here? Well, they have numerous adaptations. As you can see, we're on a rock talus slope here, and they've evolved to live in these sort of subnivian chambers, these underground tunnels in this rock talus. And they're kind of unique because they actually stay awake all winter long, whereas a lot of other small mammals hibernate. And you think pikas eat you know, mostly grasses and sedges. There's not too many of those around in the winter times. So what they do is they go out and harvest these grasses, bring it back, tuck it under these rocks, let it dry, and essentially they're storing food for the winter. If a pika doesn't have enough vegetation for the winter, if they just like run out, they weren't super studious, like what would they do? Well, a couple of things. One, they might try to steal food from another pika's hay stash. One of them is they eat their own poo. It's their own poo. They don't extract enough nutrients when it passes through the first time, so when they eat it the second time, they are able to extract many more nutrients, and it's just one more adaptation that helps them survive this sort of harsh environment. So, what do pikas sound like? They go, What are some of the ways nature survives on and around the Rocky Mountains? Some build dams that protect themselves to create life around them. Others are heartless murderers. Some are amazing climbers that use their strong legs and steadfast hooves to avoid predators. And lichen? Lichen can survive space. The Rocky Mountains, bold, beautiful, and full of nature. <laughs>